we lose and lose and lose until we're ready. Those are the words of Luthan Rail, unsung hero of the rebellion, but they could also apply to AMD. In the realm of CPUs, Red Squadron has already blown up Intel's Death Star. Or, more accurately, it blew itself up because of high voltages, but on the GPU front, they've still yet to meet the technological terror of Nvidia head to head. The GeForce line has stagnated from Lovelace to Blackwell, however, and their complacency may well be their undoing. RDNA 4 is going some way to closing the gap, and the new Radeon RX 9060 XT could be just the force wielding farm boy this rebellion's been looking for. No. No, no, this metaphor got away from me. Roll the title. It's clear that the Radeon RX 9060 XT is a shot across the bow of Nvidia's RTX 5060 Ti. It has the same amount of VRAM as the Blackwell card, being available in both 16GB and questionably useful 8GB variants, and AMD even changed their model numbers so they'd sound alike. The two questions that have to be asked then are, do they compete in performance, and do they compete on price? The first question I can answer, Asus have provided me with one of each, both 16GB cards from their tough range, and I benchmark them in a bunch of modern games at 1080p, 1440p and 4K. As for the second part, that's something I can't really tell you yet because I don't know. The 16GB version has an MSRP of 349 US dollars but Asus didn't give me a price for the tough RX 9060 XT ahead of launch, nor any indication of what the UK retail price would be. Meanwhile, Asus versions of the 16GB RTX 5060 Ti start at £429, and the tough model is currently priced around £500. If MSRP still mean anything, then AMD could be on to a winner. I've already reviewed the 5060 Ti in its own video, and externally there's not much difference between the two cards. The Tough series each has the usual faux military aesthetic style, with just the one RGB area. This variant of the 9060 XT has a 180 watt power limit, up from the 160 of the reference spec, can boost to around 3350 MHz and stabilises around the low 3300s, and the RAM is clocked at around the base level of 2518 MHz. Unlike the 5060 Ti, the 9060 XT runs off an 8 pin PCIe connector, which is good news for people who haven't upgraded their PSU lately, and also doesn't have the same awkward history as the new 16-pin connector. Both tough cards have a dual BIOS switch for people who want to cut down on the fan noise, and given that even in a case the performance mode delivered GPU temps in the mid-50s and hotspot temps around 75 to 80 degrees, I don't think it's unreasonable to turn the fan RPM down a little. My test platform is the sensibly priced high-end gaming PC, with a Ryzen 7 7800X 3D and 32 gigs of Tune DDR5 on a B650E motherboard, with press drivers for the 9060XT and the latest publicly available drivers for the 5060Ti. I toyed with the idea of benchmarking using my more economical setup, as these are lower priced GPUs after all. But the problem with the moderately priced gaming PC is that it's only PCIe Gen 4. The 5060 Ti only has a Gen 5x8 interface, and I didn't want there to be any doubts about a possible bottleneck. Also, I should note that the GeForce has access to DLAA, and in a small number of games, the 9060 XT has access to FSR 4AA both of which are currently brand exclusive technologies, so to try and keep things fair and balanced, I've used generic non-proprietary anti-aliasing in testing, either FSR 3AA or TAA depending on the title. Yes, those proprietary technologies exist for a reason, they offer better image quality, but that sometimes comes at a performance penalty, and it's not consistent across games, so it's easier to skip the issue for now, and maybe I'll come back and cover it in the future. But probably not, it sounds boring. The 9060XT starts off with a small lead over the 5060Ti in AC Shadows. It's 
functionally equal being just 5% faster at 1080p high with ultra textures and within margin of error at 1440p, but I still call this good news. In fact, if you calibrate your enthusiasm somewhat, it's possible to enjoy a 4K 30fps experience on both cards. There's worse news for the AMD in the Stellar Blade demo. Now, this game isn't out yet, and the driver I'm using is older than the demo, so possibly doesn't feature any game-specific updates yet. However, neither had the Nvidia, and even so, it manages to hold a whopping 30% lead over the AMD. Hopefully this will improve for the full release, and it's still playable on the Radeon right now, even at 1440p, but the 5060Ti has the edge. Now, I probably wouldn't expect to play Doom the Dark Ages on Ultra Nightmare, even with 16GB to play with, and yet, at 1080p, it's achievable on both cards, and this time it's Nvidia's turn to have a measurable but statistically insignificant lead. But at 1440p, you'd need to either lower settings or use some upscaling to get a suitably Doom-like frame rate. I think I need to mess around some more with Expedition 33's quality settings, because everything seems fine in gameplay, but things get really weird in the cutscenes. Performance-wise, 1080p sees another small win for the GeForce, but that lead is worn down to nothing at 1440 and 4K. Cyberpunk sees another win for the 9060XT. This is a real shame, because being an Nvidia-sponsored title and popular tech demo for their RTX technologies, it's lacking in the FSR department, and exciting new tech like ray regeneration will probably never officially make it to the game. Anyway, at the Ultra preset with upscaling turned off, the game looks just as good as the GeForce, and it gets a victory of about 3%. It's still extremely playable at 1440, and once again you could even play at 4K if you're not that fussy about performance. The script flips for Alan Wake 2, once again an Nvidia sponsored title that's even more lacking in FSR support. Still, it's very smooth on both cards at native 1080 high, and 1440 is fairly acceptable for a game of this genre, and can be brought up to 60 with only a small amount of upscaling. Performance at 4K is rough without upscaling, alas with only FSR 2 to hand on the AMD, it looks pretty bad even at the highest quality setting. The gap at 1080 Ultra is only 5% in the GeForce's favour in Dragon Age Veilguard, and as the resolution increases, the gap only gets smaller. At 4K, there's nothing to separate the two, though again, you'll probably want to turn on some upscaling. Sixteen gig cards have lots of room to play in Indiana Jones, a game notorious for its VRAM requirements. This is definitely occasion where the 8GB variants won't perform even close to the 16GB models. At native 1080 Supreme, both cards are passing 80fps, and remain around the 60 mark at 1440. At 4K, things are still broadly playable, and if there was ever an argument to be made for cinematic frame rates in gaming, then this is the game to make it in, but I'd suggest turning some settings down, or adding some FSR. On to Stalker 2, and honestly, I'm running out of ways to say it's about the same experience on both cards. Anyway, again, RTX wins by a whisker. Here's a bit of variety for you. The Last of Us Part 2 seems to prefer the GeForce, and by more than a 5% margin. At 1080p, the 5060 Ti is approaching the 80fps mark, while the 9060 XT is in the middle 60s. At 1440, the RTX is still close to 60, while the RX is closer to 50. At 4K, you could lock the Nvidia card to a fixed 30fps, while the AMD would occasionally dip into the 20s. It's easy to think of the big first-party PlayStation ports as performing about the same, but it's not always true. 
Most use studio-specific engines, which can handle the transfer to PC hardware differently. Horizon Forbidden West has a small preference for the AMD, scoring between 5 and 10% faster than the Nvidia. This doesn't make a huge difference at 1080 and 1440, but once again could mean the difference between a rock-solid 4K30 experience and a slightly wobbly one. In God of War Ragnarok, the gap starts off larger. At 1080, the Radeon has an almost 10% lead over the GeForce, which shrinks to around 5% at 1440 and even smaller at 4K. I'd only be repeating myself in Spider-Man 2, so instead I'll use my time to pass on some wisdom. If you're having problems launching this game, perhaps getting weird garbled options in the launcher, error messages about missing files, or strangely sped up footage on the home screen before being dumped back to desktop, your problem could be resolved by moving the game from your D drive to your C drive. I only found this out after having wasted half a day trying fixes and re-downloading the game on my shitty internet connection, but it worked like a charm. I guess Peter Parker doesn't like the D uh, drive. As a game rendered in UE5's Lumen, Black Myth Wukong appreciates strong RT performance even when full RT is turned off, so it's not a surprise that the RTX card wins this matchup. What is surprising is just how close it is. The 9060XC is only a couple of points behind the 5060Ti at every resolution. Finally, KCD2's performance difference is inconsistent. At 1080, the gap is around 10%. At 1440, it's more than 5%, and at 4K, it's somewhere between the two. In all cases, however, the victor is the Nvidia. The mean result across all 15 games shows the 5060Ti wins by a mere 3 to 6%, which is a hell of a result for the RX 9060 XT. The 5060Ti was a disappointingly small step up from its predecessor, whereas the Radeon is head and shoulders above the RX 7600 XT. That's actually going to be something that I cover more in another video, but there's still one question that needs to be answered in this comparison. How does the RDNA 4 card hold up once we start to crank up the RT? Jumping back into the settings menu for AC Shadows, I enabled Diffuse and Specular Everywhere and cranked the overall quality preset up to Ultra. This obviously would have an impact on performance, so I also turned on FSR quality upscaling. The Radeon card once more maintains a small but measurable advantage over the GeForce, which, again, considering AMD's historic disadvantage in ray tracing, is a hell of a result. Spider-Man 2 was obviously designed with console ray tracing in mind, so it's no surprise that even the 9060 XT can achieve playable performance in this game, but it is surprising that it does so even cranked up to the ultimate preset. It even manages performance parity with the 5060 Ti, but only at 1080p. At 1440 it falls off in a big way, losing 10% versus the GeForce, and at 4K the green team's lead extends to 20%. Stalker 2's epic preset includes some more advanced RT settings, though honestly, with the amount of noise you'll experience, I'm not sure you'd even notice. This game lacks FSR 4 support, so the 5060Ti has a significant advantage in terms of upscaling quality thanks to DLSS, but to be honest, Ray Reconstruction and AMD's forthcoming Ray Regeneration are the features I'd most like to see in this one. Anyway, the 9060 XT is playable enough at 1080 and 1440, but the GeForce has a significant advantage, far larger than at high. Veilguard, on the other hand, maintains a lot of performance with Ultra RT enabled and looks mostly fine, though I'm damned if I can see much of a difference with it turned on. Again, I've used FSR 3 on both cards, and the 5060 Ti maintains a 10-13% to lead over the 9060 XT across the board. Unfortunately, despite making huge leaps in ray tracing performance this generation, AMD still has a long way to go in terms of path tracing. 
Black Myth's full RT mode helps eliminate the distracting amount of pop-in found in Shadows, and the 5060 Ti handles it surprisingly well for a relatively inexpensive card. Path tracing used to be the downfall of even the highest-end GPUs, but this one can almost hit 60 FPS at 1080 with quality upscaling. Meanwhile, the 9060 XT only achieves half that. In fairness, this is almost three times better than the 7600 XT, but it's still woefully short of the mark. At 1440, the 5060 Ti is borderline playable, but would perhaps benefit from more upscaling. The 9060 XT is borderline unwatchable, and at 4K, neither card is worth talking about. Alan Wake 2 also has a path tracing mode, and it's also devastating. Again, I had to use FSR, this time only version 2, which really does a number on image quality, and while the Radeon holds up significantly better this time, it's still only two-thirds as good as the GeForce. 1080p is playable yet ugly, and 1440 and above would need more aggressive upscaling, which is gonna look even worse. Indy's path tracing mode is once again most attractive as a way of getting rid of the distractingly bad shadow pop-in, though you can also partially resolve that by extending the shadow draw distance in the command console. That might actually be the preferred option in this case, because the 9060 XT is woefully underperforming in this title, managing less than half of the 5060 Ti. I tested Cyberpunk at both its RT Ultra preset and RT Overdrive, the latter of course being its path tracing mode. RT Ultra is extremely playable on both cards, with there being barely any appreciable difference between the two except at 4K, at which point it's below 30fps anyway. Overdrive is actually the best AMD path tracing performance we've seen so far, only about 15% behind the RTX card and quite playable at 1440p. Again, though, Cyberpunk's upscaling solutions are skewed towards NVIDIA GPUs, so unless you can find some good mods to allow FSR 4 and Ray Regen when that becomes available, Radeons will always come a distant second in Night City. Not so long ago, I'd have said that you can't expect to get good RT performance on GPUs at this end of the market, but both cards actually really surprised me. Well, the 5060 Ti isn't that surprising, but RDNA 4 has made huge leaps forward in ray tracing, and I like to think this bodes well for the forthcoming UDNA architecture, but for the time being, path tracing is still a weak spot for them. However, given that PT is only present in a handful of games, and the 5060 Ti is still only really playable at sub-1080p resolutions, it's probably not a good enough reason to pay more for the Nvidia. Which card is worth your money then is ultimately down to the price. I'll pop a pinned comment down below when I know what the 9060 XT is selling for, and yes, it sucks that I can't get this information ahead of time. Assuming it's significantly cheaper than the 5060 Ti, I can be pretty confident in recommending it over the GeForce card. However, if the price difference is less than, say, £50, I'd be a bit more cautious. DLSS alone is probably worth paying a few quid for. One final word on the 8GB variants. I said in my 5060 Ti review that I didn't think the 8GB card was worth buying, and my instinct is to say the same thing about the 9060 XT. However, if priced appropriately, it might be a bit of a steal for esports and older, less memory intensive games. I don't think anyone's going to send me a review sample of the 8GB version, so let me know in the comments if I should buy one to compare it to the 5060. I promise I'll test them at 1440p next time. Thanks for watching, kindly do the usual YouTube things if you feel so inclined, and I'll see you next time.